As experimentation continued, two other test helmets were constructed. The TS-2, which had a rivet in the crown to hold the suspension in place, and the TS-3. The TS-3 design can be identified by a rivet, which holds the chin strap in place. Both the TS-2 and TS-3 were very similar to the TS-1. In the spring of 1941, the final modifications to the experimental TS series of helmets was completed. This consisted of welding chin strap loops to the inside of the shell, and then sewing a chin strap onto the loop. Like the M1917 of World War I, the new helmet was ballistically tested and it passed. The new helmet was approved on June 9, 1941 and was designated the M1 helmet. Sydenham's mission, however, was only half done. He now had to develop an appropriate suspension system for the new M1 helmet. From day one, the Army had insisted on a two-part helmet with an independent suspension inside the liner. As luck would have it, Sydenham wasn't the only soldier interested in helmets. A hard-charging Major General named George S. Patton Jr. was seeking improvements to the tank helmet. Patton and Sydenham had at one time both been assigned to Fort Benning, and General Patton knew Sydenham was working on the U.S. Army helmet issues. He contacted him for assistance regarding tank helmets. Sydenham had provided the impetus for airborne units to test football helmets for providing protection in jumps. He also provided some football helmets to George Patton. Patton was clearly impressed with the helmets and even designed a uniform topped off with a football helmet painted gold. The football helmets Sydenham procured for Patton came from the Riddell Company of Chicago, Illinois. When examining the football helmets, Sydenham noted the suspension system and contacted John Riddell, the company owner, for assistance in designing a suspension for the M1 liner. At the same time he was corresponding with Patton and John Riddell, Major Sydenham was working to develop a liner that would fit into the steel M1 helmet shell and hold the suspension. History indicates that Sydenham and his wife Zelma, while living in this house in Fort Benning, used a material called Vinylite in their kitchen and created the first crude prototype M1 liner. They covered it with a cotton twill cover. The liner is now housed at the National Infantry Museum at Fort Benning, Georgia. It appeared obvious to Sydenham that Vinylite probably wasn't the best material to use for making a liner, but the concept would work. He contacted Riddell for additional help in taking the prototype to the next level. John Riddell dispatched his son Jack to Fort Benning to assist in adapting the Riddell suspension into the M1 liner. Urged by Sydenham, the U.S. Army signed a licensing agreement with Riddell to incorporate their suspension into the M1 helmet liner. In Detroit, Michigan, the McCord Radiator Company had been selected by the Army to be the manufacturer of the M1 steel helmet shell. However, they were not able to proceed until a suitable liner could be produced. In a very bold step, McCord contacted the Hawley Products Company in St. Charles, Illinois. Hawley had experience in military headgear as they were currently making tropical helmets for the Marines. McCord engineers who had spoken with and seen Sydenham's design for a liner described it to Holly designers and convinced them that they could be first in line for a subcontract if they could produce a similar liner that would fit the M1 shell. Holly did indeed move forward and created a pressed paper liner covered with a cotton twill material fitted with a Riddell style helmet suspension. What's remarkable is that Holly proceeded without a contract and without an example of the prototype or even official specifications from the Army. The pressed paper liners were covered in a cotton twill and included a leather chin strap and Riddell suspension system. 100 were shipped to Sydenham who presented them to the Army for testing. It was discovered that the Hawley liners fit snugly into the McCord-made M1 steel shells. The Army was impressed and McCord was advised to proceed with the production of the M1 combat helmet with the Hawley liner. Back in Detroit, the process for producing an M1 steel helmet shell was very similar to that of the M1917 of World War I. The same type of steel, Hadfield manganese, was used, and the shape of the helmet was pressed in a huge steel die. A rim was placed around the edge of the steel shell, and finally chin strap loops were welded on. A heat of the steel stamp was pressed inside the helmet to identify each lot of steel. The helmet was then painted and textured with cork rather than sawdust. Once the helmets were dried, the chin strap was then bar tacked onto the chin strap loops. In 1942, General Patton sent a letter to Major Sydenham requesting additional examples of the Riddell football helmet. Patton's soldiers had recently started to receive the examples of the new M1 helmet with the early liners. Patton, in his own hand, wrote at the end of the letter, 
We now have some of the new infantry helmets. The liner is the best one that we have tried. High praise indeed for Sydenham and Riddell. The M1 helmet then went into full production with the vast majority of steel shells being produced in Detroit by the McCord Radiator Company. A company called Schluter in St. Louis also produced M1 steel shells. The letter S stamped near the heat of the steel stamp can identify Schluter made M1 helmets. McCord made shells have the heat of the steel stamp but no identifying maker's mark. The chin straps on the early M1 helmet were made from a heavy khaki cotton webbing. On one side of the chin strap, a metal buckle with a small arrow connector fitted between a hook system on the opposite chin strap side. This buckled the chin strap in place. Over the remainder of 1942, Holly produced some 4 million liners, but eventually it was determined that the liners were not suitable for combat operations. The pressed paper liners were fragile and very susceptible to moisture. They were eventually declared unserviceable and no more were produced. Holly was recognized by the War Department for its service to the nation and was awarded a Battle E for outstanding war production. Holly wasn't the only company making liners in the early days of the M1 helmet program. Two other companies, Hood Rubber and St. Clair, also produced early versions of the M1 helmet liner. They used what was called a low pressure method to make helmets from a cloth impregnated with resin. This resulted in a hard plastic-like material. Unlike Holly's liners, these low pressure liners featured an insignia eyelid in the front. It should be noted that during the early days of the M1 helmet program, there were very loose standards and helmet liner makers were getting limited guidance and really no specification information from the Army. Eventually, helmet liners made using the low pressure method were declared unsuitable for combat. Apparently, they could shatter and produce lethal shards of material when struck. The helmet liners that eventually became standard and preferred by the military were produced using a high pressure method. By this time, specifications were being distributed to liner makers. Companies with household names such as Westinghouse, Firestone, and Inland produced some of the finest high pressure liners. These liners were made from a resin soaked duck cloth that was positioned in a mold and then hydraulically pressed into the correct shape with a force of 150 tons. This resulted in a hard, smooth surface, such as this unpainted example. The manufacturing process for converting the raw duck cloth into combat helmets was complex. It required many steps, both with machines and by hand. For example, after the duck cloth has been soaked in resin, it was cut into discs and then stamped into a hat shape. Once positioned in their hat shape form, the liners were then placed onto a conveyor system to be taken to the molds. Upon arriving at the pressing area, a press operator placed the duck cloth liners in the molding press. Here the liners would feel the pressure of the 150 tons and kept in that state for two minutes at 220 degrees to obtain the necessary shape. Once the curing process is completed, the newly pressed helmet liner is removed from the mold. Next, the newly pressed helmet liner went to a press punch. Here an operator inserts the new liner and the machine removes the flash or the excess material from around the edges of the liner. After the flashing is removed, the liner then moves to the next step in the process. Here the raw edge of the liner was burnished to bring about a heat seal. The newly pressed liner is then positioned in a multi-drill press operation where all the rivet holes and insignia eyelets are drilled into the liner. The liner then moves to the rivet station, where the rivets and insignia eyelets and web suspension are punched into the still unpainted shell. Once the rivets are installed, the helmet is ready for its finished coat of paint. In this case, the helmet liner is sprayed by hand. Some manufacturers, however, used an automatic system where the liners were sprayed while moving on a conveyor system. The newly painted liners were then placed onto a slow-moving conveyor belt through an infrared oven. Each helmet liner was exposed to the heat for about two minutes to bake the paint onto its surface. Once the helmet completed curing, the liners were then inspected for quality control. Finally, the completed liners were packaged for domestic shipping. Complete with suspensions and chin straps, they were packed in nested stacks of five liners separated by paper. Thirty liners were shipped in each box to be matched up with steel helmet shells.